How many nutritional studies are done each year and how many of them are you aware of? Uh, I've never counted all the nutritional studies done each year. It's in the thousands. And uh, of course, I don't read them all, uh, but I do try to keep track of what are likely to be the most important studies done. Uh, but the flow of information is so great at this point in time, no one person can keep track of all of this. You talked a bit earlier about saturated fat. Many say that eating saturated fat and cholesterol leads to adverse health outcomes. Do you agree with this? Why or why not? Yeah. When we're talking about anything in the diet, like saturated fat, it's always important to ask compared to what? Uh, if you compare saturated fat to trans fat, actually saturated fat works better. But if you compare saturated fat to carbohydrate, uh, it partly depends on what type of carbohydrate. <clears throat> if you uh, uh, compare saturated fat to refined carbohydrate in terms of health outcomes like cardiovascular disease, there's probably much, not much difference. Uh, saturated fat versus refined starch is comparing bad with bad. But if you compare saturated fat to uh, unsaturated fat uh, uh, plant oils that contain a, a good combination of polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, then saturated fat is related to higher blood levels of LDL cholesterol and higher rates of coronary heart disease and uh, higher rates of total mortality. So in, in nutrition, the comparison is always important. And it's important to ask about what the comparison if, if that's not been explicitly made. What impact does obesity have on diabetes? Mm. Obesity is very strongly linked to rates of type 2 diabetes. It's probably about the strongest association that we see in nutrition and health. Uh, for example, people who have uh, 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 obesity, particularly the higher grades of obesity, have about 60 times the rate of diabetes compared to people who have a healthy weight. Uh, so it is the most important driver of uh, risk of type 2 diabetes, uh, but it's not the only driver that uh, diet quality plays an important role. Uh, uh, physic being physically active uh, plays an important preventive role as well, but those diet quality and physical activity, are, of course, are feeding into risk of obesity itself. So these are intertwined risk factors, but in some ways, obesity is sort of summarizing the, all of the adverse inputs from uh, inactivity, uh, too much sedentary time, and poor quality diet, and the result is uh, skyrocketing rates of type 2 diabetes in the United States, but in almost every country around the world at this point in time. Do you recommend low-fat foods in the supermarket, or do they just add extra sugar to make up for having less fat? Yeah, yeah a lot of the low-fat foods in the supermarket are not healthy foods that, uh, to a very large degree, sugar and refined starch have replaced fat. And that's not going to be advantageous, and very often it will be a worse product than the original higher-fat uh, product was. Uh, that. Uh, what we've seen in uh, our own studies, and many other people have seen too, or uh, looking at different types of studies, that fat per se is not a villain, that the type of fat is really important. There's some negative information on calcium supplements. Do you recommend calcium mm -hmm. supplements? And where should people get calcium from? Should mm -hmm. people drink cow's milk to get mm -hmm. calcium? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the story on calcium is very complicated. Uh, the first, uh, this goes back to the question of how much calcium do we need? It is absolutely essential that we get calcium. Uh, we've known that for, for uh, many, many decades. Uh, it is uh, critical for maintaining bone health, and calcium plays lots of other uh, critical functions biologically as well. But how much calcium we really need is the, is the central question here. It's not whether we need it or not. And the calcium requirements uh, in the United States have been set very high, for example, for people over 50, over 1,200 milligrams a day. But, uh, and it's pretty hard to get to that number on a daily basis if you don't drink milk or take a calcium supplement or, don't, or have some other dairy product beside milk. But the question is, do we really need uh, calcium intakes that high? And we've known for uh, many decades now that people who are countries, areas that have the highest calcium intake, drink the highest amounts of milk, actually have the highest race, rates of fractures. And that's been a sort of paradox. What's going on? And uh, a, a red flag to, uh, in terms of our understanding of uh, calcium intake and dairy intake and fractures. 
Uh, those high rates of uh, milk intake would include the United States, but even more so some of the Scandinavian countries in Northern Europe. Uh, other people have looked, we've looked at our st uh, studies in more detail, and we don't see that higher calcium intakes and higher dairy consumption uh, are necessarily related to lower risk of fractures. In fact, uh, interestingly, we found that uh, tall height is a quite strong risk factor for hip fractures and other fractures as well. Uh, and uh, that uh, made, us, uh, made me think a few years ago, what, what is it that makes us taller? We know that when people move from Japan to the United States uh, after a generation or two, they are much taller than they were uh, in, in living in Japan. And when we've looked, it does, it's uh, pretty clear that milk is the most single important uh, factor that's driving greater height. And that actually shouldn't be surprising because the biological role of milk is to make young mammals grow fast. So it's got all the essential nutrients and hormones that drive rapid growth to make us uh, grow when we're, when we're young. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're meant to be drinking that large amount of milk uh, uh, all of our life. Uh, in general, uh, cell uh, growth is related to cell multiplication, and that's related to higher risk of cancers. Uh, uh, and uh, going back to looking at the data then, we, uh, we looked and we saw that higher rate of uh, higher consumption of milk was related to greater height. Uh, higher uh, height was related to more fractures. And so when we actually looked at milk consumption during adolescence, uh, particularly for uh, boys, we saw that the, the boys who drank the most uh, milk during adolescence actually had higher rates of fractures during later life. That's probably because uh, it's easier to break a long stick than a short stubby stick. We've got more leverage with a long stick. And if we fall from a higher, a greater height, uh, there's going to be a greater force and more likely to uh, break a bone uh, uh, if, if you're tall and fall. So we, I think we understand part of that link between uh, uh, higher milk consumption and higher risk of fractures on a population basis. So all of this question goes to how much calcium do we really need? Uh, and uh, we've, it does look like uh, the World Health Organization has concluded that if we get even as much as about 500 milligrams of calcium a day, that would be adequate. The U United Kingdom looked at the data. They said 700 milligrams of calcium a day would uh, be adequate calcium intake. Uh, and uh, if we, we can get to that 700 with a decent diet and say one serving of dairy a day, uh, if we're not having any dairy, uh, then if we're not really confident that we're eating a diet with a lot of calcium, I think it is reasonable to take a calcium supplement, but five or 600 milligrams a day would, on top of what we get scattered across lots of different foods in our diet, that would be adequate. Uh, higher amounts of calcium supplements may have some negative consequences at high in amounts of supplements. There are more, uh, there's a greater increased risk of uh, kidney stones, for example. Uh, some concerns raised about cardiovascular disease. I don't think uh, that body of evidence is consistent yet. But uh, again, if we get to seven or 800 milligrams of calcium a day, that, uh, that's probably adequate. And uh, drinking a lot more milk uh, to get to 1,200 milligrams a day, I, I don't think is a wise thing to do. Do you recommend moms give their kids fruit juice? No. Fruit juice is, is a complicated area for uh, quite a while, there was a recommendation that uh, to drink, uh, and, and certainly no concern, about drinking 100% uh, natural fruit juice. But actually, most fruit juice, uh, including apple juice, orange juice, has uh, about the same amount of sugar as uh, Coke uh, does. Uh, it, there's a lot of sugar in there. And the problem is that we can drink that juice down so easily, so quickly. Uh, it's useful to think that, uh, consider the glass of orange juice has about three oranges if you actually sque squeeze them yourself. Uh, uh, very few people would eat three oranges on every most days of their life, where it's so easily so easy to drink a whole glass of juice and, and go on for a second uh, glass of juice. Uh, so uh, we have seen, not surprisingly, that higher juice consumption has been related to higher risk of type 2 diabetes. and. Uh, 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 will have some adverse metabolic effects that we would get from just consuming a large amount of sugar. There do seem to be some positive benefits, interestingly, from orange juice. 
uh, and orange juice is, um, it does have a lot of nutritional value. Uh, so I think it's reasonable to have a small glass of orange juice on a daily basis. Uh, there are some very possible health benefits from that. Uh, uh, and it was an important public health intervention actually back in the 1950s and earlier when uh, there, there was scurvy in the United States. And so there was a recommendation to have a glass of orange juice every day. At that time, it, it, wasn't, it was probably a good recommendation. It did help uh, eliminate uh, scurvy uh, and uh, make sure that people got adequate vitamin C in their diets. But of course, we tend to go overboard. And that small glass of orange juice uh, once a day has turned into many people for uh, uh, juice is a major primary source of beverage. In fact, I did that a, little, a few decades ago. I was drinking a lot of juice and realized that I was getting maybe six, 700 calories a day from that as uh, really uh, fast absorbed, fast acting carbohydrate. And uh, interestingly enough, I just took that juice out of my diet and lost five pounds uh, and uh, probably improved my metabolic status as well by doing that. So. Uh, limiting juice as is being done is, I think, a good thing to do. Having that small glass of orange juice a day, um, actually, I think that's probably a good idea from what we see now.